so I am going to call the uh, April Polk City Parks and Parks Board meeting to order. First, uh, is that me that has that background or someone else? Want to make I sure think, it's not me. I'm I think it may be you. I'm not. I'm not sure. Okay, sorry. I will turn my microphone off as quickly as I can. Um, can the secretary please call roll? Yep, this is Josh. Uh, Ashley. Steve. Pre present. Sorry. Yeah, here. Kelly. No, Kelly. Amy. Here. Monica. Here. And Nick. Here. And this is Josh. I'm here as well. Thank you. Uh, minutes were sent out. Uh, can I have a motion and a second to approve the minutes from the March meeting? I motion to approve the March minutes. I'll second. Second. Any, um, I had a, a for the good of the group suggestion last week, and this is one that has been kind of universally accepted in online uh, procedure etiquette, and that is just to say any opposition, and instead of everybody voting pro or yes, they only ask for opposition. Is that okay with everybody? Yeah. All right. So any opposed to the passage of the March minutes? All right, perfect. Uh, Jason. <clears throat> All right, uh, number four, there are no audience items tonight. Nobody is on the phone. Um, <clears throat> so I will dive right into number five. Uh, the review of the regional park initial concepts. So last Wednesday, the 31st, Confluence uh, met with the advisory committee and shared some initial very high level concepts of what the regional park, um, what could fit out there. Um, once again, very high level stuff. Um, let me share my screen with you guys. <clears throat> All right, are you seeing um are you seeing this? Yes, we have it. Yeah. All right, perfect. So um first I'm gonna run through uh the little PowerPoint here that Confluence had prepared for us. And um obviously I was in attendance um as the parks and recreation uh representative. Ashley was there on behalf of the parks commission, and Josh was there. Uh, on behalf of Little League. So I'll certainly ask for those two to chime in um, a majority of this since this is the Parks Commission feedback section. <clears throat> all right, so uh, they started with just a real quick agenda. Um, really quickly, what they heard from all the stakeholders, um, the, the four concepts that they reviewed, and then we did follow it up with a pretty good discussion. Um, I'll keep this brief because I, I sent this out to you guys, but um, you, you can see the common themes of what they heard um, from several different stakeholders. Um, so certainly a lot of people's interests were very aligned. <clears throat> um, some more common themes, some other thoughts, um, more of those passive recreation um, amenities like dog parks, um, you know, um, pickleball courts. Um, so when you say passive, initially, a lot of people think of, well, it, it's <laughs> passive recreation is things that you really don't schedule for. It's not ball fields. It's something that you could just be passing through and take advantage of, uh, you know, so also think trails and, you know, things of that nature. <clears throat> um, certainly they had input from uh, Little League and soccer. Um, when it came to specific sized fields. Uh, so just some dimensions and things here. Uh, and just some pictures of ideas they shared with us, what could be. This is kind of the topography of the land. And one of the big positives that came out of this was that 
more of the site is going to be usable than uh, initially thought. Uh, so that was music to all of our ears um, to know that we get even more of this 57 acres to really play with. <clears throat> all right, so here is concept one. Um, and, and so this is a, a healthy mix of ball fields, um, soccer fields, multi-use fields, um, and then also some passive recreation. So um, the pond is, there will be a pond. Um, we have figured that out um, for water detention and then also for irrigation on site. So there is wiggle room to work with the location of the pond, uh, but there will be one. And we really don't have an exact size in terms of acres or anything yet. Um, but here you can see um, kind of off on the west side, um, a, um, kind of the aqua color. Um, that would be a trailhead for the proposed high trestle trail connection. And that's the red line that you see um, going through here, left to right and out the top. Uh, and then also it incorporates a splash pad um, as well. And, and so again, they really came at it with, <clears throat> again, just showing what could fit here. So again, not, nothing here is set in stone. Um, and an interesting thing here is that they have a, they have a few soccer fields ghosted um, on what would be the school property. So there, there are ongoing conversations um, with Confluence and the school district um, about that possibility. So don't see that and think it's a for sure, um, far from it, but it, it's very encouraging that all sides are working on that. <clears throat> and then they just had a few pros and cons of concept one. Um, I figure I'll run through all four concepts really quickly and then we can kind of have, or you guys can have some discussion. <clears throat> Concept two, again, it's a healthy mix of ball fields, passive recreation, multi-use um, soccer pitches. Uh, and then again, you can see where the pond here, <clears throat> totally different location, still fitting the same need. And here you can see that the high trestle trail connection it's not the most direct route. It's more meandering on the outskirts of the property. Um, this was done on this particular concept to avoid number of sidewalk and road crossings, which is certainly um, <clears throat> a very important safety issue that we'll all take into, effect, uh, into consideration. But it was really also interesting to see, you know, the shortest distance between point A and point B on concept one and then, um, you know, the road less traveled of concept too. Um, I, I think both have their merits though. <clears throat> concept three is showing, um, furthering the idea of putting one sports discipline, in this case, soccer at the new location and retrofitting the existing sports complex to accommodate all baseball, softball. Um, and <clears throat> that was later in the presentation, there's just a rough drawing of what all ball fields would look at the existing sports complex. It's not as in-depth as this, as that was truly outside of the scope of Confluence's project. Uh, they just felt um, that it would be sure nice that if they showed us all soccer, just what all ball fields would look like at the other one. This certainly has um, some passive recreation as well. This doesn't incorporate an indoor rec center as well, or at least saving the space for one. Uh, and then here, a little bit more natural play. Two ponds, um, kind of a natural, um, just topography, uh, landscape, flora fauna on the southwest corner of the property. And then the entire inverse, uh, this would be all ball fields and then retrofitting the existing for entirely soccer. Um, again, you can see some things that are consistently throughout all four concepts, some sort of play structure. Um, dog park is pretty um, pertinent, trailhead for that tr connection, um, you know, storage facilities, the pond, uh, and, and then parking as well. Um, 
So this would um, roughly go with concept three of all soccer. That's just a very crude drawing of what all ball fields um, out on West Bridge Road could look like. Uh, and then here's one, another kind of scaling it down to six. Um, but, and here's what it would look like all soccer. Um, we questioned if those three um, <clears throat> on the top of the screen, I guess it would be um, west, all those eight U's, that's getting awfully close to the slope uh, coming from the lake. So I don't know how feasible those three would absolutely be. And then here's just kind of a side-by-side -side comparison. Um, and at this point, I'm going to turn it over to um, Ashley as the representative for the Parks Commission <clears throat> on this advisory committee to kind of lead the discussion. Um, this is your guys' discussion, so I'm just here, fly on the wall. So all things Parks Commission, <laughs> uh, hey, floor is yours. Can you, can you disable uh, or can you enable my ability to screen share by making me a co-host? You bet. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm going to just kind of give a brief overview of then what came to fruition after people were able to chime in with any questions or anything like that. But before I do that, does anybody have any questions or comments that they would like to add immediately so we can add? I'm going to keep a running tally of anything anybody wants to talk about as we go. And then I'm going to kind of create a parking lot for us and we can go back and look at those things that we wanted to make sure that we touched on. Does anybody have an imme any immediate feedback they would like to add? Do we know, I was not part of the, um, the recreational field discussions, but how, how many fields ideally were soccer and little leagues wanting and how close do any of these concepts get to what their needs were? I'm gonna go ahead and defer to Josh on that if he wants to answer that for little league and then I'll answer for soccer. Josh, do you want me to answer that question or would you like to answer? Yeah, for, for little league, we asked for eight fields. Um, four baseball, four softball, all, all the baseball ones about a 310 foot length. So you could fit, um, you know, the youngest kids to so the 60 foot bases, 70 foot bases, 90 foot bases. Those are kind of the three steps uh, in age order. So um, we asked for eight in concept one, there were seven. And then we lost another one in concept two down to six, and then that last concept with the rec center, I think had all eights in there. Um, as for soccer, their greatest concern was actually the older ages because those fields are so large. Um, and so they wanted three 19U fields. They wanted three 12U fields. And then they wanted a plethora of eight U fields. The key with soccer though, is that they said over and over again, it's the space allocation that is their primary concern because they can repaint the lines um, as needed, but they wanted to make sure that they had enough space to be able to at least have the option to have that number of fields because that's what their demand is. Um, but, um, I think they had like some, that would be like what they need versus if we could have this other option. And it's like, you know, I think it was five 19 U fields and they could start hosting some tournaments and stuff. And so that's one of the reasons that the two fields are ghosted into the school property on concept drawing one. So, um, the biggest thing though was getting those full size fields in because they just don't have a lot a lot of options right now for that space. And all of those games are presently being hosted at the high school on the turf. Um, and in the fall with flag football and regular football and soccer and then club soccer, that field and that scheduling gets to be enormously uh, challenging because it's just so clustered for them. Um, the other thing that um, Josh didn't mention that is also important to discuss is that 
um, Jason and Parks and Rec had also requested one or two softball fields that can be used for adult softball. So a full size softball field, um, because there is an adult slow pitch softball league, but there's also an opportunity to host some slow pitch tournaments and to do some other things that would be a money-making venture for the city of Polk city. Um, if we did have four full size softball fields. Um, so I'm going to share my screen again. Um, oh, sorry that I am not going to share my screen again. I'm going to ask first, did anybody, that was a really good question to, uh, from Monica, does anybody else have any other immediate feedback or questions? Yeah, so um, are we even looking at three and four? You, Because one of them is all soccer, one of them's all baseball. I, and are, are we seriously looking at doing them that way and then using the field, the Army Corps field as an alternative? So I think that's a really good question. And um, when we listen to the um, landscape architects from Confluence, they felt obligated to present those options because it was something that was presented by multiple stakeholders to have the present facilities be converted into one sport and have the future facilities be used primarily for a different sport. Um, with that option, there's going to need to be some significant investment in both sites in order to be able to utilize that space for the other site. Um, in our conversation, so now I am going to share my screen. In our conversation, that was actually, uh, Steve, the very first question I asked was, this seems like a lot of money to be investing because if you're going to completely upheave the Army Corps um, facility, the present facility that we have, you're talking about doubling your budget. Because if it's soccer, you're pulling down all of those backstops, all of those dugouts, you're pulling out all of the clay that goes on the softball field. Um, if it is so or if it's softball baseball that stays there, you're putting up all of those fences, you're putting up all of those dugouts. Um, and so one of the converse or one of the questions that I asked immediately was, is it possible instead of splitting sport by sport, which concept three and three had or three and four had, would it be possible to split by age? Um, and one of the things that Josh mentioned um, was it's really like that six to 10 U where there's a lot of dual athletes and you have a lot of kids that are playing both sports. And so one of the things that um, I was actually delighted to hear um, both the United representative that was there and the Little League representative that was there were open to that idea and being able to make maximized usage of the facilities that we currently have because then you can have a kid that's literally taking out their shin guards and going to a softball game or baseball game immediately after their soccer game is over. Um, the other... Um, advantage of that is um, I doubt the Army Corps would ever leave us high and dry, but the reality is, is that we are at the Army Corps' mercy on that land, and God forbid somehow they would ever shut that property down to us or they would decide to develop that into something else, then we would have one sport that would be completely without facilities. Um, and that's a huge concern when we start thinking long-term about what these plans look like. So kind of the really long answer to your fairly concise question was everybody started to look at these plans and agreed with exactly what you're saying, Steve, and that is maybe it's better to divide these by ages and have both facilities present at both sites. Um, which may allow families to help with scheduling and stuff like that for kids at the older ages and still permit there to be space for tournaments and some of the more intense competition that you see as kids get older. That answer your question? Well, it, it sort of does. But so what I think you're saying is one and two are very much in play here and three and four are, we could possibly do it this way. Right. That would be a, a, a good summary. Um, 
Another comment that was made about this number four one was there, the rec center here is very large. It's about the size of the rec center in Huxley. Um, and so this would be like basketball courts, volleyball courts. I mean, it would be a full recreational facility, which would be a very high budget item. And that would not be something that would be built right away. And so there was lots of questions around, do we build this park and utilize this space for the needs that we know that we have right now? Um, and again, Jason, going back to that survey that they shared, some of the top tippy top items on people's wish lists were a trail connection, which makes the trailhead a top priority, um, a dog park, which makes the dog park a top priority, ball fields, both soccer, baseball, and softball. And then one of the other ones that, you know, we haven't talked about all that much, but was really, really high on people's list was a splash pad. In fact, I think that that was one of the number one reoccurring themes that everybody came back to, even if they were a stakeholder from an organization like Little League or something, people were really interested in having a splash pad and having that be an option. So this, this particular one with the large rec center, you would basically have this entire quadrant over here in the top. This would basically all be just blank space for a period of time because there is currently no money available for that. And if we think about the phases of this project rolling out, I don't know how long that's going to be. And um, Jason, I am totally blinking. What's the gal's name that's the business manager? <laughs> oh, you mean our city manager, Chelsea? Yeah. What? Kelsey. Kelsey. And she mentioned that too. She said, because someone asked, you know, when will we have a bond for this? When will it go for a vote? And she was very remiss to even give a date. And she said, this is a, you know, 50,000 foot view. Like we're not even close to knowing when, when that would be, but you're still going to have to have money for this project. And that rec center would be a huge chunk of money. And so collectively the group kind of abandoned that thought. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't have a rec center. They just thought that this might not be the perfect time and place to put it in this particular location. Then when we went to um, concept three, um, I can't remember. We just thought this didn't meet the needs of soccer or Baseball, softball, um, the softball fields were cut up. The baseball fields, there was only two of the requested four. And then um, soccer doesn't get the number of larger fields that they had requested. So this one didn't seem to make a lot of sense or meet the needs of anything that anybody had requested. There was this minor community center up here and there was a lot of green space, but there wasn't a lot of um, like multi-purpose space. So if there was going to be a need for checking out snowshoes or fishing poles or whatever the place, this community center would be very, very small um, and wouldn't necessarily meet the needs of some of those more um, passive recreation opportunities. And then um, we went back to two and four, which are the, oh, I'm out of order here. Um, so everybody kept going back to this particular concept. Um, and even though there is only three baseball fields instead of four, um, that was something that Little League was willing to accept um, in order to be able to keep the facilities that were available at our present site. Um, and we talked a lot about this 12U field that's right here, kind of in the middle. I don't know how to mark this up. Um, nope, not like that. Sorry, friends. Um, in, in the middle right here by these uh, community building parking spaces, and then there's this 12U field. Um, one of the conversations was, if we get rid of these 8U fields that are up here because the 8U fields are gonna stay down at the present facility, that gives us the option to add some additional parking, to do some other things with that space. And then this 12U field can become a dog park. Um, because again, that was something that was really high on people's lists. 
And this community building, um, we loved the idea that there is a trail that goes around the pond similar to DMAC. So there could be the option of adding in mile markers. It becomes kind of a natural track for people. Um, and then the community building can be a multi-purpose space. Um, there was conversations around possibly having it being half indoor and half outdoor so that there's a large like picnic shelter event space. If people wanted to have an indoor outdoor event, being right next to the pond, it makes it a beautiful space to have an event of some kind. Um, the community building could also serve as a place where you can um, rent parks and rec equipment or Jason may be able to house camps or clubs or other activities and events in that space. Um, and with a, an absolute dearth of programming for seniors and anyone over the age of like 45 in this community, that community building, maybe not long-term, will be large enough for a rec facility for us, but it would at least meet some of the immediate needs that our community has that are presently going unmet. Um, there was a lot of talk and concern about having the trail go through the middle of all of the traffic and parking lots. Um, and so there, there was a conversation about potentially taking the trail over to the far east side behind the baseball fields through this detention and prairie area, and then meeting up with the trailhead over here so that bikers can move um, without feeling like they are A, in other people's spaces, and B, also at jeopardy of you know, their ride not going through fluidly. Um, the other thing about this particular map is that the trailhead is isolated from the fields at the furthest point from the fields, which is nice because they'll have their own parking lot in their own space. And being that far removed from the athletic fields means that it's less likely people are going to take up the parking space that is designed for cyclists that are utilizing that trailhead space. So there was some conversations about trying to fit in some of those other needs um, that people wanted into this map, but this particular concept um, which ended up being concept number one, actually, was the concept that kind of universally the, the groups that were present at that moment were interested in. Um, Dr. Mart did mention that these two fields that are ghosted on the far west side, he said he can't guarantee that those would be available, but the building that's being built is over 200 yards from those soccer fields that are ghosted there. And he said that the um, folks from Confluence could keep them there at this time. So that sounded like a promising relationship, but again, no promises. So what do the representatives of our committee who are also involved with baseball, soccer, softball, think of one and two? So this is Josh. I, I can speak to that on behalf of Little League. Um, our preference was option one, just to give us you know, seven fields versus the six, um, you know, also looking at the opportunity to have the younger kids maintain the core ground for their athletics, uh, both soccer and, and literally kind of agreed to that, you know, you can still do a lot of the, the younger kids down there and then kind of have that graduation at nine years old up to the, the bigger fields or the nicer complex or whatever you want to look at it. But it gave us a good mix of, you know, being able to add seven fields to the four fields we already have. Um, it would also give some benefit to the, the school as well, because right now they play all of their junior high, freshman, JV, varsity, baseball, and softball on one field each to where, you know, you can open up some daytime hours for them as well to be able to have some extra practice space if, if they wanted to have a, you know, the opposite of the agreement than what soccer would have with soccer with those ghosted fields. So, um, the other nice thing that we really liked about this one is it had over 760 parking spaces across the whole complex and multiple entry and exit points, which would allow it to, to decrease or spread out the congestion on those really heavy uh, traffic days. 
So option yeah. one. Yeah, it, it's option one. I, I think in what Jason sent out, it's marked as two, but on Confluence's spread sh or a presentation, it was concept one. So it's the concept with the seven baseball softball fields and the three 19U soccer fields. Which the, is what we're looking at. Correct. I Which was is just going to say, at. this yep, is this the one, one we're looking at. Yep. Yep. Cool. Great. Great. Um, I would make a comment from um, High Trestle Trail point of view and from cycling point of view. And that is uh, when we have people, hopefully, potentially, coming in the High Trestle Trail from the north side, we want to be, um, we, we want to create an experience for those bike riders. And dragging them right through the middle of parking lots is not the kind of experience that I think we want to create for them. So I would very much be in favor of the concept that showed the trail going around the outer edge through the detention area, through the natural area. My only question is whether that would fit on the south side of the softball fields there. If they would, I suppose they could be moved up a little bit to accommodate that. But Bikers love trees and they love water. So to get down there by the pond uh, would be great. I really like that concept that had two ponds, but I, that's probably too much. And, that, and one of the concepts had a bridge too, which is a cool feature, but uh, that doesn't really fit with the concept we're looking at. It's still bringing the bike trail uh, around the outer like that around the outer edge yeah, yeah this is this is closer steve to what we had talked about doing yeah um and i think it's really important to note here as you're you're looking at this particular one um it would be quite similar distance from this far south softball field um around the edge and again you know being the fifty thousand foot viewpoint where these softball fields and baseball fields exactly lay out is going to change based on the grading that they do. So as you look at this map, you should know that this will have some terraces in it because of the present grading. So the top two the, for this north baseball field will probably be on one terrace and then you'll have a, a little hill, then you'll have that next baseball field and that parking lot then another little hill, and then those softball fields will sit a little bit lower. So the other nice thing about having it go around this space, they can move and shift those softball fields a little bit so that there is room for that particular trail. But it's also nice because those cyclists can pick up some speed and not have a concern about, you know, who they're running into or the spaces that they're um, being a part of because they're not going to be going through the thick of things and they're going to be going downhill if they're coming in from the north to the south. The other thing that's nice about this that um, Confluence had mentioned was this detention area and the space that's marked on the southwest corner as natural. Those two spaces are natural wetlands. And so even though we can't necessarily put a building on those spaces or like a manicured field, these would be great spaces like what you were saying, Steve, you know, to put in a wildflower field or to put in, you know, maybe some picnic tables or even a, a resting space. Um, and so if they don't want to necessarily rest at the trailhead, these would still be very natural oriented spaces um, that would be able to be enjoyed. We just don't know exactly what they're going to look like until we go through that grading process. Well, I'll just comment kind of along the same lines of Steve, I think, in that all of like the concepts feel very like it feels like a sports park to me. Like I don't go to the Army Corps Sports Park unless my kids have an event. You know, I don't go there to ride my bike or to get on the trail or to like, I guess my point is like the way some of these are in this one in particular, it doesn't leave a lot of activity or space for those other or value as highly those other activities. And I just don't know if it'd be as big of a draw for those people that want to go for a run or go for a bike or go for a walk 
or go to the pond, you know, so I just add those thoughts as well. And I think that's really important because if this does go to a bond, people vote on what is going to be advantageous for them to have access to. And if there's nothing in that space that is a positive for them, why would they do it? Right? Why would they pass it? Um, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be a Nelly naysayer. I'm just trying to be pretty practical at this point. Um, and so I think one of the next steps that was discussed in some detail while we were at this meeting was the idea of drilling this down a little bit more specifically, adding in that dog park, talking about where the actual storage facilities go, mapping out maybe what this community building looks like, talking about you know the different signage and stuff that would go into the park so that people can see that at the 10,000 foot level, it's a little bit more clear than the 50,000 foot level. And right now all you see is kind of these big dedicated spaces because that's how they need to know that the land is getting um, parsed out, but like there was other conversations about using like this parking lot space could be, could have poles in order to be used as pickleball courts when it's during the weekday and there's no sports and recreation going on. But again, those are things that are going to be at the next step because I had a lot of the same questions that you're having. Um, I was also curious about like the splash pad and the dog park, like where are they going to park? And are people going to want to go use a splash pad right next door to a large parking lot where people are coming in and out for soccer? Um, and so I had some questions and concerns around that as well. Um, but one of the things that um, Jason said that kind of rang true for me is the people that are going to be walking around the pond um, are not typically the people that are going to be using the sports facilities on a Saturday at noon. They're more likely to be doing it during the day or in the evenings. Um, and so I don't know all of that to be true, but I do agree with you wholeheartedly that there needs to be some more conversation around how does this space become a multi-purpose and a multi-function space, knowing that we have a multi-generation and multi-interest community. So I would ask the question also, the, the area there in white that goes around the pond and through the softball fields, so forth and so on, is that all 10 foot multi-use trail? I don't have that answer, but I will definitely send that question because our next step is asking any further questions that we want Confluence to answer, sending them on to Jason, and then they're supposed to redo this um, proposal with greater detail and then come back to the committees with those details inserted. So I think that's an excellent question. Yeah, I think with this concept, it's just hard. I mean, it's it's easy for people to visualize what, you know, a baseball, so softball, soccer field looks like. But if they could drill it down a little bit deeper and kind of provide some more definition about what, what does this trailhead look like? What, what do these um, walking paths or bike trail look like? What does the splash pad look like? Um, these natural areas, you know, that might be really worth d digging into a little bit more to provide that clarity for people so that they do recognize that it's more that there's more going on here than just sports. And Collins did say when it gets to the point of starting the marketing campaign around it, they would have it down to those details. But kind of where we're at now trying to get to a master plan, you know, it's just at a high level, this is what we're looking at. And then when we're ready to start marketing it and getting people to excited about it, that's when they would add those added details and pictures and, and what it would feel like. Keep saying those things though, because they're things that we'll reiterate to them as we go back. I think it's important to keep saying those things. So in that, yeah, that trailhead area, I guess you said there would be dedicated parking for that use. Um, 
you know, maybe just question about like restrooms or just what other types of amenities would be good to know too. And I, Steve, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the, the things that they told us was that the high trestle group and the cyclist groups had submitted a, a pretty specific plan of what they wanted included in the trailhead and kind of a design of what they wanted that to look like. And they had just dedicated the amount of required space for the plan that had been submitted to them. Is that correct? Well, Jason might have to answer that, but part of the answer is yes. When we did the community visioning plan, we did designate the trailhead structure itself to be a certain size and then there were some tables and um, coverings around it and benches and stuff like that so yeah we were that was pretty specific when it comes to to the size there that didn't really include parking however so um, I don't know maybe Jason knows are we looking at kind of a three quarters, one quarter split with this trailhead size here, or is it more half and half structures and facilities and parking lot based on what we've done with community vision? Steve, right now, I, I feel like we're at that 50,000 foot look. I, I don't have a good answer for you. Um, I can just piggyback off what Ashley said there of you know the proposed square footage of that trailhead blob right there took into um, account what community visioning did share at your guys's meeting. Um, uh, again, a lot more detail to come in this process. And that next step would ultimately show, you know, here's the Polk City connector trail feature, you know, that community visioning is kind of designed. Here's the parking, here's signage, here's, you know, restroom facilities, you know, whatnot. But that'll all be on the next concept um, when we dig in even deeper. Okay, and I do have to backtrack uh, and our, I'm looking at it right here. Our concept drawing did include asphalt parking. So it could all fit. Yeah, I, they did specifically mention your guys's concept that you had submitted and that they had allocated space based on your concept. That was one comment that I know that they made, so. It sounds like they were listening to, to your concerns and needs. I have a silly question, I think. No question is silly, Steve. Do, I've never been to a dog park. Do they smell? Hey, that is a great question. I actually asked the same thing. I really did, because I was like, mm. um, this dog park uh, would be, have you ever been, have you ever driven on um, 235 by where the Windsor Height Walmart is? You know what I'm talking about there? Yes. Off to the south side of the road there is the Windsor Heights Dog Park. And it's more of like an agility-based dog park where there's some, you know, recreational things for dogs to run on and stuff like that. There is not a pond and there is not any necessarily like a... Uh, it won't be like West Des Moines. Um, so they said that there would be a place for waste and disposal that will need to be addressed. Um, and the uh, maintenance folks were at this meeting as well. Um, and they said that that was one of their big things is that they just have to make sure that this particular facility, that they have enough staff to care for things like that. Um, but they said you really only come into concerns when you have like ponds and other features in a dog park that are a little bit more in depth, this one would not be that large or complex. It would be more of like a, a fenced in area where dogs could roam freely with their owners present in the inside of the fence. Any other questions? These are good ones. <clears throat> I 
Okay. So I, unless someone comes up with something and you want to share that with the greater group later on, that was a lot of information to digest in a really short period of time. So you, if you have any other questions that you want to make sure that get addressed, please make sure you either email Jason or I, and we'll make sure that they get forwarded onto the Confluence group. All right, Jason, you want me to do the next one or you, do you want to do it? Nope, that's all you. <laughs> okay, so um, I had a neighborhood um, page Facebook thing. I don't know, what are those called, Jason? Do they have a name? Oh, the, the neighborhood citizen group? Yeah, group? yeah. Um, and one of our... Um, parks has a lot of pet waste in it. Um, and it's not that, um, people aren't picking up after their pets. It's that they're disposing of the pet waste in the garbage cans, um, in the park. And, um, there was a question about pest, pet waste receptacles being put into the parks. Um, and for a lack of a better description, it's kind of like a garbage bag uh, distribution system coupled with a diaper genie. Um, and then there is a place to put pet waste that animals like raccoons and other scavengers cannot get to the pet waste. And it doesn't become smelly and it doesn't become a nuisance. Um, they would just need to have it be collected by the facilities people um, over time. Um, they said it was a conversation about five years ago and then it got tabled and never brought back up. And so I said, I would bring it back up. As a pet owner, with two dogs that we frequent the parks, it would be nice to have, I could say it would be nice to have those in the parks. We're, we're always pretty diligent about not putting it in the garbage because it's very clear in the existing park signage that they don't want that done. But um, it is kind of a pain, especially when you trek across town and you don't necessarily want to carry that with you always. Right. So this is kind of what they look like. And also my daughter's softball coach just called me. So I am going to turn my camera off. Jason, would you be able to take control for a second? Yeah, no problem. <clears throat> um, so yeah, at, at, <clears throat> as the city rep here, um, I'm what I'm planning to do, I'm gonna touch base with uh, Public Works and see exactly what that conversation looked like five years ago. I mean, I, I don't have a lot to share with you guys <clears throat> right now. Um, I'll kind of, ask around, see what was discussed, why it ultimately didn't happen, um, kind of see what concerns were there from the public works crew um, and kind of try to move forward with this. Um, I, I guess the strategic placement of these is, I mean, it, it seems like a really good idea. So maybe, uh, again, this is, this is just pure speculation, but maybe, they were worried it would be too many of them and you couldn't walk a block without seeing <laughs> doggy bags. I'm not sure, but I'll, I'll try to figure out exactly how that conversation went. Go so ahead. I don't know if there was an additional conversation five years ago, but at least a couple of years ago when I was on Citizens Group, we had brought this up about asking why we're not supposed to put pet waste in, in the garbage cans in the city parks. And it sounded like it boiled down to it being an issue of overusage by person or persons and then city staff simply not being trained to deal with that level of waste. So it just became a blanket rule. Don't put pet waste in the garbages. Okay. So you'd have to check with, with Mike at Public Works to really verify that that's their stance then and now. Yep. No, I certainly will have some conversations with Mike and see if there's not a path forward. Um, I, I guess- okay, I, Can I ask a follow-up question? 
What did you mean by they're not, they don't have the ability to ha handle waste? Do you have to handle pet waste in a particular way? I, that was the answer we got was that they weren't trained to deal with waste, to deal with animal waste. I, I can't expound on that anymore. That was just what we got as an answer. I didn't know if there was like a particular, like if waste management tells you, you have to do something particular with pet waste. Cause if there is, I'm totally doing it wrong. FYI. <laughs> just thinking the same thing, actually. <laughs> I was like, oh man. Maybe it was more a matter of not having bags. Recycle. Like do people just somehow scoop it up, and put it in the garbage without bagging it first or something maybe? We weren't told what the initial issue was that caused them to put out the, the blanket statement. We just told that we're told that there was an issue and <clears throat> yes, that they weren't trained to handle waste, handle mm. that waste. Well, I will, I'll have conversations with Public Works and I will uh, deliver a report back to the commission um, at a future one with information to share. I mean, in my mind, it's, I think it's, we want to encourage people to pick up after their pets. So let's make it easy for them to do so if we can. I, I agree. And that's one of the reasons why it was asked then as well. One thing I want to throw out there before we move on to the next item. I, I hear this a lot from Neil Smith trail users. Um, and that's just an information piece that that is not Polk City property. So we can't go throwing dogway stations every quarter, half or mile. That would be an Army Corps decision on that trail. So um, sure. that's where I get the most, um, the most inquiries into this. And I, I know exactly why, you know, this weekend I went for a bike ride and the sides of the trail are littered with doggy bags. So I, I get it. I get that one. <clears throat> that might be something that maybe we can reach out to the, um, is it Army Corps or DNR that owns that? Who maintains that? Uh, Army Corps. I mean, maybe we can reach out to them and just say, hey, we had this concern about our parks, but one of the major places people were worried about was Neil Smith. Is there any way that you would like to collaborate with us on this? You know, maybe we've got an option there to find a renewed partnership of some sort. I don't know. Obviously it's not just a Polk City issue because people use that trail that aren't from Polk City. Sure. No, I'm, I'm happy to <clears throat> reach out there as well and well, start some it's, dialogue. It's a combination of Army Corps and DNR. I guess when it gets to Big Creek, it, it goes over to the state, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. And then way down south, there's a piece of it that goes over to the state, too. But that's way past Polk City. <clears throat> no. All right. Any other questions? Jason, we'll put that down for a few. Yep, I'm happy to bring that back around at a future meeting. Awesome, thank you so much. All right, let's move on to item agenda, the next one, which is um, fiscal. <clears throat> yes, so can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay, um, so this is something I just like to do <clears throat> for full transparency with my parks commissions um, that I've done in the past. Um, I do a cost analysis of every program uh, that I run and every quarter I kind of like to put it in a nice neat table to tell the bigger story of how particular subsections are doing. So, um, and this is going to be the easiest one you guys will ever see since I <laughs> was only able to start doing programming in March. Um, so I haven't split into preschool programs. Obviously no preschool programs were offered in quarter one no youth programs, adult program, uh, March adult yoga. So here I just have participants, expenses, revenue, cost recovery, and just some final thoughts about it. Um, so no, I mean, very small sample size, but I'm very pleased with um, how March adult yoga went. Um, it did um, fall in line with um, 
the cost recovery me methodology that um, my department follows where um, fitness and or adult programming should at least break even looking at 100% cost recovery, if not be a revenue source. So March yoga coming in at 122% cost recovery, um, bullseye. I mean, that's what I, I like to see when it comes to my adult programming. Um, so then obviously in the future, I would have other things and, you know, it, it would tell the total of, you know, particular programs, but also the quarter of adult programming, you know, how did I do overall? Um, and then the last one that I'll always include is um, senior programming. Um, and again, none existed in quarter one of 21. So um, when I bring this back to you for quarter two of 2021, it should be a lot more colorful and more numbers, but something I just like to share with you guys in council uh, periodically throughout the year. <clears throat> uh, are there any questions about that or the cost recovery methodology that um, we're using in this department? So I just have a quick question and that is, can you give us an example of what we could expect to see added in these areas? I, I always get confused because softball, baseball, and soccer are outside of parks and rec. <clears throat> sure. Um, and, and honestly, Steve, I think the next point on our agenda, when we look at the summer brochure that came out, that'll tell the story a little bit uh, with concrete examples. But um, for example, preschool programming, um, I have a few, um, they happen to be sport specific, but they're for three to five year olds. Um, they're part of, it's a, um, it's a national program called Start Smart, where um, you know it, it deals with teaching a sport, but also socialization, fine motor skill development, um, and it's done with a parent or guardian um, participating with the child. Um, so that would be an example of preschool. Um, also, you know, if I were to ever have a facility and we did something like you know, talk time where you could come in and there's a bounce house and a million toys to play with. You know, that would just be some sort of preschool um, program. Youth programs will be kind of the summer um, camps that we have. Um, I've got some summer fun camps planned for this summer, um, kind of a, a catch-all all-star sports camp. Um, and then also throughout the year, youth dodgeball is something that I plan to do um, in the colder months when I, we're driven inside. Um, so things like that would all exist there. But no, you're right. I mean, Little League and soccer, you know, that's that's a whole other beast. That's not me. That doesn't get put in here. Um, adult programming could be anything from, you know, adult painting, um, fitness classes, a, adult leagues that I do. This summer, I'll have a, a bags league and um, a slow pitch softball league. So things like that will um, be here. And then senior programming, um, you know, um, age specific fitness classes um, would fit in there. And then also a, a very popular program for this um, demographic is day trips. And I've got a few of those in the summer brochure as well. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of high level. Is that, yep. is that what you're looking for? Thank you. Of course, you're welcome. <clears throat> um, and Jason, I think that leads us into a perfect transition into the next agenda, agenda item, which is the summer programming. Yes. Um, all right. So I switched it on my end. Does everybody see the change? Okay. So uh, this is just um, the first Polk City Parks and Rec um, brochure ever. <laughs> so um, yeah, this is something that... Um, kind of comes out seasonally. My intent here is to do a summer brochure, a fall brochure, and a winter spring. So three a year. Um, so here, I'm just gonna kind of slowly scroll through. Um, please holler at me. Um, this one is a little bit shorter than what I intend to do in the future. A lot of these that are being done this year, um, 
are because my comfort level with offering them in another COVID summer. Um, you know, I, I have to take that into consideration with anything that I'm offering this summer. Um, so a lot of this will be outside, you know, to increase the opportunity to socially distance and also class size, um, keeping it smaller. It's just a little bit more manageable um, to, again, space out wh where you can um, and kind of enforce mask wearing, um, what have you, as we go through. Um, so yeah, I, it, it's going to kind of have the same layout, um, <clears throat> each brochure. I'll have a preschool section. Uh, so in this one, I've got a few start smart um, opportunities, um, soccer and football. Um, then youth programs. Um, so I'm able to offer um, some art classes uh, this summer through uh, Kids Create. Um, and then also first time I thought a director's message might be nice, introducing myself to the community. Um, and then, yeah, we kind of get into the summer camps um, that exist. So like I said, we've got a summer fun camp where um, it's a week long of activities. Um, <clears throat> they could go to an um, aquatic center, indoor and outdoor activity centers, um, hiking, um, things like that. And then on all-star sports camp, it, it's something that I've offered other places and it's, it's just a lot of fun. It, it gives kids an opportunity to explore a lot of different sports in a short amount of time. Um, and in my experience, they just kind of have a ball with it. No pun intended, sorry, <laughs> that was terrible. Um, let's see, um, something I'm, I'm really trying to feel out here is uh, Lifetime Tennis has a very well-respected um, summer program that they do with parks and rec departments around the Metro. Um, I know they've been wildly successful with Waukee and Urbandale. And it, it's something that I wanted to offer this summer just to see what that interest in uh, tennis is up here. Um, <clears throat> so this is one where they pretty much will bring all the equipment, they'll bring the expertise. Um, I'm handling the registration, the facility, <clears throat> and then obviously communication as well uh, with the registrants. Uh, and then, <clears throat> so like I said, I'll start with preschool programming, I'll do youth, and then I like to get into adult. Um, so here I've got my bags league that'll be taking place at the Legion here in town. Um, co-ed softball, <clears throat> our ongoing yoga class on Tuesday evenings. Uh, and then <clears throat> an acrylic pour paint. Um, uh, again, it's a lot of, you know, I, I loved uh, arts and crafts, fitness, um, health and wellness, uh, cooking classes, a lot of those things are coming. Again, it's, it's a lot of those things that, you know, a kitchen, a cooking class is indoor and I'm trying to minimize indoor classes this summer. Um, and hopefully just being able to be, you know, full throttle in the future. <clears throat> and then senior programs. Um, I'm going with the definition of seniors are 55 years and older. Um, so yeah, I, I just have a few day trips in here. Um, shopping at the outlets and going uh, downtown <clears throat> to the uh, Papa John Sculpture Park, followed by lunch at Americana. So, um, and that's one of those things that I, I, I found throughout my career is, is especially <clears throat> as we age, sometimes what we think of as recreation changes. Um, so, you know, things like this, while to me and you, it's, it's not exactly recreation, but it is. I mean, it's a chance of getting out of town. Even if you just go to the outlets to walk around, it's the socialization that comes with these trips that's just so important as we age. Um, yeah, I, I'm a big advocate of senior programming and I plan to offer quite a bit. And then I'll also kind of do <clears throat> special events as well. So this summer I've got some yoga in the park scheduled and then also movies in the park. <clears throat> Um, and then, yeah, just, um, a little feel good about last summer when we couldn't do anything. So we did the scavenger hunt and these are just some of my participants. All right. <laughs> Any, awesome. questions? Any questions for anybody? How is registrations going so far? 
Um, so far, it's, it's been encouraging. So I think I'm still fighting the fact that not everybody knows we have a parks and rec department. Just it's, it's been a weird year to really get out there and talk to people. So yeah, it, it's pretty steady every day since registration went live. So um, I'm going to do a few concentrated efforts um, between now and when school gets out. You know, we do have a lot of time before these programs really take off um, the first part of June. Um, but no, th this is pretty typical for summer programming. You like to have your brochure go out around spring break, middle of March. Um, so it gives parents plenty of time to, you know, think about what they want to do for the summer. I just want to throw out there too. Um, I've seen a couple of comments on, um, Facebook and had some community members ask me about kind of the difference between, um, the summer fun week that's available versus the parks and rec program that we've particular that we've had in the past. Um, and it just took a couple of really short conversations for me to have with people who are friends and to say, I know that's what we've had in the past, but that's all we had in the past. And we weren't, we didn't have anybody that we hired in this position that was taking care of these programs. And there wasn't any forward planning and thinking. Um, and all of those things take money. And even though that this is a change, we're investing our money in a different way. And I know this program is looking different for a lot of people. And I'm sure there's some bummed out kids out there too, because that was a really fun program for a really long time. But I just want to encourage all of you that if like you hear people and they're concerned about programming or they want to add programming, I've been trying really hard to be kind of a, I don't want to say an intermediary, but an advocate for like the changes that are happening right now, because change is hard on people. And I think once people know why the changes are occurring, they're a lot more likely to buy into them and be accepting of them. Um, and as community members, I think we have a better advantage to doing that than maybe Jason does putting out the fires on his own. I don't know if you're getting fires, Jason. I just see the others, the, the, the Polk City mom side of things. So if you I, guys put, I put out some, yes. Um, and you're absolutely right. It's, you know, um, it, it, it's, that's just the way it's been for such a long time and people get used to it. Um, you know, and talking with people is about the best thing that I could do because it is, it, it's an education piece. You know, this summer was going to look different regardless um, because of COVID, you know, I, I had to take that into consideration when I was dealing with class sizes, but yeah, there is also a, a giant financial piece to this puzzle too. As we move to offering programming 12 months a year, you know, we can't spend all our money for a six week program in the summer. If we want to do stuff, the other 46 weeks out of the year. So um, yeah, I, I think it's just a, a growth pain uh, <laughs> as Polk City gets bigger and we, you know, we look for opportunities year round instead of just the summer. So um, no, if, if anybody's ever interested or wants more detail, um, I'm sure I could bore them with the financial details of a lot of these decisions, but I, I'd certainly be happy to. But no, I mean, these were made with um, a lot of thought. These changes were a lot of thought went into these. So and then kind of on the other side of that, if you know of someone that maybe is interested or has a special talent in the community that would be interested in offering a class collaboratively through Parks and Rec, send him Jason's way. I uh, talked to Ken Morse the other day and I asked him if he would do a tree planting and tree care course. <laughs> and he was like, I'm good. <laughs> But I mean, that's the kind of stuff I do think that there would be a lot of people interested in, you know, a houseplants class. And, you know, I, I'm with Jason. I have a lot of passion around senior programming. Um, and, you know, one of the things that my grandma had a ton of time doing, a ton of fun doing was um, she just had a group and they met every Tuesday at the community center just to meet. Um, so I think all of those things are good things. And yeah, so A+. Plus. Uh, next thing kind of goes along with the COVID and the summer parks planning and adding some of that, which is returning to in-person meetings. Yeah, so um, our city council is, they're um, meeting next week on the 12th. They are going to do it in person. Um, and so because of that, all boards and commissions 
um, are going to have conversations at their April meeting, like we are here tonight, to discuss how you guys would like to proceed starting in May. Um, so right now, I can tell you that next Monday's council meeting, um, all uh, council members will be, um, masks will be <clears throat> required inside City Hall. And they are also um, keeping, it, it's almost a hybrid. Um, so for the public, it'll still be a call-in option. Um, but in the chambers will be um, pretty much the minimum number of people to make it run. So we'll have the council members, the mayor, city clerk, uh, and city manager um, going. Um, I know right now Public Works is working on plexiglass dividers for the dyads at the front of the room. Um, just everybody else in the world is buying plexiglass right now. So um, yeah, so that's why they're going with the mask option um, for at least the first one of April. So um, you know, I, I wish we had all seven of you guys here to make decisions like this and we can certainly follow up, but, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of a, in my opinion, I'd like to look at it as an all or nothing kind of thing. I don't want anybody to feel uncomfortable, um, enough to not want to come to a meeting. Um, I mean, I, I think the city values your guys' volunteerism top notch. And, you know, if that's continued on zoom, so be it, that's fine. Um, but no, I'll, I'll, turn it over to you guys for any comment that you may have. I'm going to step back because I have the privilege of being fully immunized in the first round. So I, I realize I have privilege with that. And so I'm going to let others chime in because I don't have as much on the line. I also will be fully vaccinated by the time we get to the next meeting. So I, I'm in the same boat where I'm not going to say no. Um, but again, depending upon the space we're in, we're talking about having eight or nine people. And if it's in the community center, that's still plenty of area for less than 10 people to spread out and still be able to maintain a discussion. Is that where we met before? Was the community center or no, do we meet in city council in, chambers? You'll be in council chambers. Okay. Sorry. Newbie question. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I will also be fully vaccinated. So I could go either way. I do appreciate the city taking the stance still of requiring masks in buildings. I just always feel more comfortable with that, but um, I'm fine either way. I assume the public would still be probably calling in and stuff if anyone cared to join. Correct. Okay. I am fully vaccinated. I could go either way. I love Zoom. It is convenient. <laughs> right, Ashley, as you're in the car? <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I'm a single parent this week. So I am running three children to all the places, even when they have to be two places at once. So. <laughs> well, um. I too will be fully vaccinated by our, our May <laughs> meeting. So um, no, I, I, I think, thank you everybody for the feedback and I will, I'll maybe reach out to the three commission members that are not on the call at the moment and see where they're at. And um, yeah, I'll certainly um, be very transparent with uh, the decision and I will chime in to say today was the first day that the vaccination is available to the general public, regardless of age or um, tier that you are in. Um, and there is a plethora of vaccine available right now, both Methodist and um, Mercy uh, or Unity Point and Mercy do have appointments available at, gen ed, at general clinics. Um, and Polk County is getting large shipments of all three vaccinations in the next two weeks. So, um, there's just an FYI, if anyone needs one, and then it looks like our last item is just to adjourn. Did I miss one? Mm -hmm. I've got some particulars for you. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, um, no, that's okay. I didn't see a commission person in the room, so I was going to skip that one. No, um, yeah, no, our, our no liaison report tonight. Um, but no, um, just a few things. I'm going to keep it really brief since we're well over an hour. Uh, a couple months ago, I applied for an Iowa Foundation of Parks and Rec mini grant um, in the amount of $1,000, and I was awarded that. So 
that will be going towards um, recreation program equipment. And I'm thinking those things that you just, you have and you use for multiple programs. So like the dodgeballs of the world and, you know, things like that. So um, no, they will present, um, they, they make a really big deal out of it. So they're gonna present a check to me at a future council meeting. Um, but no, very excited. Um, always happy to, you know, stretch our dollars a little bit further um, when those grants exist out there. Um, to piggyback on more free money, uh, the Arbor League received $2,000 uh, from Mid-American as part of their Trees Please program. Um, they typically only ask for a thousand. Um, I really nudged Ken into having him ask for more uh, considering the duration of damage that we uh, uh, suffered. And yeah, so $2,000 to the Arbor League. I know they're very ecstatic with that. Um, and then my last piece, uh, this is kind of a, <clears throat> a Ken Morse thing as well. Um, our, our tree board, uh, they conduct an annual inspection of our parks and right of ways and give recommendations to, uh, in the past it's been public works and now it's also me. So um, they kind of came to us with a laundry list of things that could be improved. And our public works has been working on that. You may see um, some work was done. Um, Town Square and Kiwanis Park are the two uh, primarily. And that was a lot of leftover um, damage from the derecho um, that it was just smarter to take care of now than when it becomes a problem in the future. Um, so Public Works has done what they can do in-house. I am working with some uh, contractors as well. Um, some of the projects were a little bit bigger in scope um, with equipment that we just don't have as the city. So, um, so yeah, that's all I have to report on my end. Is there an update about the Friends of Folk City Parks? <clears throat> Um, not, not at this time. So it's still legal is still um, going through the minutia of creating the 501c3. Um, and then, yeah, the next step would be, um, you know, pretty much manning that 501c3. And, and um, I, I think we've got a good start on something. So I, I think more to report at a future um, commission meeting. Awesome. Well, if there is there anything for the good of the cause? Well, as always, I'll tell you that we're moving forward with High Trestle Trail Connector and with Community Visioning. Thank you for work on that, Steve. I know that there's a lot of people that have been excited about what's coming out of that. So I really appreciate having your voice both on this commission as well as working so diligently on that. Anything else for the good of the cause? Mm -hmm. All right, thank you everybody for your time. Can I get a motion and a second to adjourn? Move. Second. All right. Any opposed? All right. Lovely. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a wonderful night.